So the title of this morning's discussion is the first step in revolving, resolving the controversy over the current role of the guru in ISKCON. Now, something I should say right now is uh, what we're trying to achieve here. We don't expect to resolve the issue during three or four hours this morning, but we're going to give a chance for the issue to be uh, aired in public uh, in this fashion, maybe for the first time. We met this morning, the participants met this morning for about a half an hour to go over the format and uh, agree on the rules of the presentation and so forth. So what's going to be happening is that for the next hour, the devotees from New Jayapur will be presenting uh, their point of view on this issue. And then after that, we've allotted another hour for a reply by uh, Rabindra Saroop and Jayadwaita Swami. Then after that, we're going to take a 15-minute break. And immediately after the break, we're going to have a question and answer session. The questions uh, should be submitted in writing. And the questions will be answered by both groups. Uh, within a specified amount of time. So as you think of questions, issues that you'd like to see discussed or brought up, then please write them down. You can either uh, give them to Naveen Krishna during the break, or Ma Shringa, the sergeant at arms, will periodically go around and collect your questions. The questions that will be accepted will be questions that are uh, the most on the topic and seem to be relevant and interesting to the greatest number of devotees. Should, people should specify if they have these questions directed toward a particular person or to one side or to everyone. If, if you like, you can direct the question to a particular person, but uh, both uh, points of view are going to have a chance to express themselves on each issue. Now, we've also decided on a few rules for the discussion. Uh, number one is that we're not going to talk about the history of the development of the guru system after Srila Prabhupada's departure. We feel that that issue has been gone over enough. But what we're, the focus of this discussion is what system did Srila Prabhupada want for continuing the disciplic succession? And uh, we'll also focus on the present state of initiations in ISKCON. A few operating rules are that the uh, speakers will be interrupted if they significantly wander off the topic or if they cast aspersions on any individual, either present or not present, on their character or their motives in devotional service. Also, speakers will be warned if uh, they insult any other speaker, or if the voices start to get raised, or somehow or other this discussion is uh, interrupted. And uh, not heeding the warning, then the speakers will lose their speaking privileges. Yes, Hari Velasparu. What if someone in the audience has a comment to make and not a question? Then uh, the matter should be mentioned that on your piece of paper. Pass it forward. Do you have a comment to make on a specific uh, topic? And if there's time after we if we see that everyone is satisfied in the questions and answers, and that the major issues have gotten aired, then if we have a little extra time, we'll uh, allow the devotees to get up for a few minutes and speak their point of view. Since we're not expecting to reach a conclusion here, uh, the last half an hour of this meeting, which is running till 2 o'clock, will be dedicated to taking proposals for continuing the process. First, we're going to ask the devotees whether you're interested in continuing this process, whether you think that uh, it should be discussed further in the society. And if so, then we'll take specific proposals 
as to how this could become an ongoing process until such time as it's resolved. Any questions about the procedure? Okay, then minute, we'll be good. Didn't we agree on a specific topic? topic? topic. Yes, I said that. What system did Srila Prabhupada want for continuing the Sampradaya? I don't think you said that. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, he did. What system did Srila Prabhupada want to implement? Okay, any other questions? All right, the floor is yours. Sir. We have We're going to focus in on the present state of the guru system in ISKCON. We're not going to talk about what happened after Srila Prabhupada departed, what mistakes people think may have been made or like that. Yes, Prabhu. Would it be reasonable to ask if another few of the uh, devotees here could go on the side, uh, let's say the GBC side or whatever, with uh, Jairwood Swami, in case they do have comments like uh, some other devotees could speak up without sending the paper and so on. Well, that's up to them. This is their presentation. If they want to bring anybody else up, they're free to. We have to negotiate that with them. Okay, so I'd like to thank all the participants for taking the trouble to come here. And before we start, uh, let's take a moment to offer our obeisances to all the assembled Vaishnavas. Ah, uh, 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 <laughs> That's what I feel like doing. Is this supposed to be uh, working? Oh. Okay, quiet, please. We don't have any microphones here for amplification. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine So thank you very much for having us here and allowing us to speak. Uh, this paper that I'm going to present today is more or less a follow-up uh, to the VVR 11 issue. So the background of what we're going to speak about to some extent is this BVR 11, we've passed a number of them around the room, so if you didn't get one, um, I'm sure there'll be somebody near you who does have one. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Rupa Velastas. This is Nichananda Prabhu, the president of the Jayapur, Karnamrita Prabhu, the, uh, what shall I call you? One of the uh, editors of Vedic Village Review, Jasodhanandan Prabhu. Uh, from Toronto, Roy Das Pandit is here, and uh, various other devotees. All right, so this paper is a kind of follow-up to that uh, last issue of Vedic Village Review. So if you're not familiar with it, maybe perhaps you'll get the time to do that later on. The title of this is Evidence and Precedence for the Ritvik System. Questions have been raised as to the historical precedence of the Ritvikacharya system. What must be immediately noted in this regard is that many of Srila Prabhupada's activities as an Acharya were unprecedented, as were many of the activities of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Some have argued that Srila Prabhupada did not perform any unprecedented activities, but this is clearly not the case. Some examples of such changes are, one, Harinam Diksha being given by mail, two, Brahminical initiation being given by tape recording, three, Ritviks or deputies chanting on initiates' beads, four, the performance of marriages by a sannyasi, five, young unmarried women being allowed to live in the ashram as brahmacharinis, six, initiates' names being given at the time of Harinam Diksha. These activities, especially those relating to Diksha, were all unprecedented. Yet, at the same time, there were pragmatic arrangements made by Srila Prabhupada to facilitate his running of a worldwide Vaishnava society. He quite obviously could not be everywhere at once, yet such arrangements would allow him to give maximum encouragement to his followers with whom he could not often personally associate for training, instruction, and initiation. 
The scriptural principle is that one must approach a bona fide guru for initiation. The procedural aspects are details. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur also performed activities unprecedented in the Gaudiya Sampradaya. For example, one, he adopted the Ramanuja Sampradaya system of sannyas. Two, he allowed brahmacharis to wear the saffron cloth previously reserved for sannyasis. Three, he gave Brahminical initiation to all Varnas. Four, he allowed sannyasis to wear sewn cloth, to ride in cars, to travel across the ocean, etc. All of these activities were forbidden by the Vedas. All of the changes instituted by these acharyas were practical arrangements which were meant to facilitate the preaching of Krishna consciousness in human society. A Mahabhagwat or Mahajan may perform unprecedented acts or create novel methods for the salvation of humankind. Srila Prabhupada details this prerogative of the powerful acharya in the pages of Chaitanya Charitamrita. For example, every acharya has a specific means of propagating his spiritual movement with the aim of bringing men to Krishna consciousness. Therefore, the method of one acharya may be different from that of another, but the ultimate goal is never neglected. Therefore, although I am a sannyasi, I sometimes take part and getting boys and girls married, although in the history of sannyas, no sannyasi has personally taken part in marrying his disciples. Arrangements made by fully liberated and authorized souls whose will and sound vibration are not different to Lord Krishna's establish precedents, which may be followed without any fear of there being defective understanding, cheating, mistake, or illusion on their part. This having been said, it is worth pointing out the origins of the Ritvik system. A Ritvik is an officiating priest who performs a sacrifice or ritual on behalf of another. This is described in the Mano Samhita. I'm, my Sanskrit is not good enough to try to pronounce this, but the, you can see the verse. He who has been duly chosen to act for another person for the purpose of setting up a fire sacrifice, for performing a sacrifice where cooked grains are offered in the sacrificial fire, or for performing the Soma Yagya and other such Yagyas is called his Ritvik officiating priest. Manu Sanghita 2.43 In Krishna, chapter 22, we find Ritvik rendered as learned performers of sacrifices and correspondingly in Srimad Bhagavatam 10.23.10 10, we find the line Mantra Tantra Vijog Agnaha There the word Ritvijaha is translated as priest. It is obvious from the preceding statements that the concept of Ritvik has its origins in Vedic literature and a Ritvik is one who performs a sacrifice or ritual on behalf of another, senior Brahmana. Srila Prabhupada began to use this system of officiating priests whom he later referred to as Ritvik Acharyas, deputies and officiating Acharyas when his mission became spread throughout the world and when it was no longer possible for him to be personally present at all the initiation ceremonies. I just want to point out that he did not start to use this terminology until 1977, as far as I know. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but this terminology, Ritvik, was not known by many, at least, until then. It was not possible for him to chant on hundreds of sets of beads, Gayatri threads, etc. During these years, he instituted a number of unprecedented but sensible practices to facilitate the initiation of new men. These practices were one, the status of officiating priests being conferred on Malachas who had taken up the practices of Vaishnavas, Chant, two, chanting on the beads of initiates by such deputies, three, second initiation granted via such deputies by a tape recording, four, spiritual name giving transacted by mail, and on the basis of recommendations sent to him by his temple presidents, he granted all candidates his shelter and had his deputies perform the ceremonials. This system was briefly suspended in 1977 when he became very ill. It is important to note that these deputies were not known as Ritviks pre-1977 and that no one in ISKCON was familiar with the term. It is mentioned only very briefly in Srila Prabhupada's books. In May of 1977, Srila Prabhupada had some discussions with Tamal Krishna Goswami about naming Ritvik Acharyas to initiate on his behalf. According to Sodhananda Prabhu and Goridas Pandit Prabhu, disciples of Srila Prabhupada who both spent 
much time with his divine grace, in 1977, Srila Prabhupada intended to set up a Ritvik system with some adjustments made for the time when he would no longer be with us. Although Srila Prabhupada had high hopes for his disciples' advancement, he noted on several occasions in his last years that none of them were fit to be acharyas or bona fide spiritual masters. That a Ritvik system to continue after his departure was desired by Srila Prabhupada has been confirmed by the statements of Srila Prabhupada, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, Jasodhananda Prabhu, and Gauridas Pandit Prabhu. Consider, for example, the first of the appointment discussions. Question, Satsrup Maharaj. Then our next question concerns initiations in the future, when you are no longer with us. We want to know how first and second initiations would be conducted. Srila Prabhupada, yes, I shall recommend some of you I shall recommend some of you to be to act as officiating Acharya. Tamal Krishna Maharaj. Is that called Ritvik Acharya? Srila Prabhupada, Ritvik, yes. May 28, 1989. Now, it is interesting to note that among the GBC men present at the time of this exchange, Satsarup Maharaj, Rameshwar Swami, Kirtanananda Swami, and others, no one but Tamal Krishna Goswami was familiar with this term Ritvik. The question arises as to how the term and its meaning became known to him. In the Topanga Canyon Talks, December 3rd, 1980, Tamal Krishnamaraj admitted that there had been discussion of Ritviks prior to the May 28th meeting with Srila Prabhupada. What actually happened, this is a quote, what actually happened was that Prabhupada mentioned that he might be appointing some Ritviks. So, the GBC met for various reasons and they then went to Srila Prabhupada, five or six of us. To date, we have no recordings of those prior discussions. According to Goridas Pandit, there were discussions about Ritviks which were taped, which are presently not available, their whereabouts unknown. He specifically remembers that Srila Prabhupada stated that the Ritviks would, quote, initiate disciples on my behalf when I leave the planet. This, of course, simply confirms Srila Prabhupada's statement from the May 28th conversation. The question arises that if there were significant discussions before or after the May 28th meeting about the functions and duties of Ritvik Acharyas, then why are the recordings of those discussions not available? Where are the recordings? If the discussions were not recorded, then the question is why not? Tamal Krishnamaraj has admitted that there were discussions prior to the May 28th meeting. Where are the recordings thereof? These discussions would have great relevance to the present issue. Gauri Das Pandit Prabhu reports that in 1977 when he related Srila Prabhupada's remarks about Ritviks initiating on his behalf after his departure to a number of devotees, including Jasoda Nandan Prabhu, Tamal Krishnamaraj came to know of it. He became furious and reportedly stated, Gauri Das, you're finished. You'll never be allowed to do service for Prabhupada again. I told you not to tell anyone what Prabhupada says without first clearing it with me. After this, Goridas' service was apparently suspended for some days, but no suitable replacement was found, and he was re-engaged with suitable warnings about repeating Prabhupada's remarks without clearance from Tamal Krishna Maharaj. On July 8, 1977, Srila Prabhupada named 11 Ritviks who were stationed in various parts of the world so that geographical considerations were accounted for. That is, a candidate could approach a Ritvik who was physically nearby in order to receive initiation from Srila Prabhupada. During the discussion, Srila Prabhupada added another feature to the system. Tamal Krishna Goswami, referring to the Ritviks chosen by Srila Prabhupada, these men, they can also do second initiation. So there's no need for devotees to write to you for first and second initiation. They can write to the man nearest them. But all these persons are still your disciples. Anybody who would give initiation is doing so on your behalf. Srila Prabhupada, yes. Srila Prabhupada thus took himself out of direct involvement with the process of initiation. The prospective disciples were to approach their temple president who would write to the local Ritvik. Srila Prabhupada wanted the book of disciples' names continued and he confirmed his own detachment from any further direct participation in the initiation procedure saying, so without waiting for me, whoever you consider deserves. That will depend on your discretion. On July 9th, a letter was sent out, signed by Tamal Krishna, 
Maharaj and signed and approved by Srila Prabhupada describing the procedure of Ritvik initiation in detail. See enclosure, we have a copy of that letter included in the booklet. Um, that letter was signed by Srila Prabhupada and it's uh, included in this booklet here. Jasoda Nanan Prabhu reports meeting with Tamal Krishna Maharaj on July the 10th and Tamal Krishna Maharaj showed him the letter. Jasoda Nanan Prabhu wrote down the following exchange immediately after the incident. Jasoda Nanan does, what does all of this mean? Tamal Krishna Goswami, devotees have been writing to Prabhupada asking for initiations. And now Prabhupada has named 11 Ritviks who can initiate on his behalf. Prabhupada said that others can be added. Jasoda Nanan does. And when Prabhupada departs, Tamal Krishna Goswami, they'll be Ritviks. That's what Prabhupada said. In a letter to Kirtananda Swami, written by Tamal Krishna Maharaj on July 11th, this is also included in this uh, booklet, we find the following interesting remarks. A letter has been sent to all the temple presidents and GBC, which you should be receiving soon, describing the process for initiation to be followed in the future. Srila Prabhupada has appointed thus far 11 representatives who will initiate new devotees on his behalf. You can wait for this letter to arrive. The original has been sent to Ramesh Maharaj for duplicating. And then all the persons whom you recommended in your previous letters can be initiated. I have marked the expression in the future because if the above mentioned Ritvik arrangement was only for the time up until Prabhupada's departure as some have claimed, then why not say for the present, for the immediate future or until further notice? The phrase, in the future, does not indicate any cessation. One might arguably propose that to even hint at Srila Prabhupada's departure would have been in poor taste, even offensive. Yet, Srila Prabhupada had already announced his imminent departure in May of 1977 upon arriving from Hishikesh and had regularly repeated the inevitability of this event thereafter. What's more, Satsarup Maharaj had already asked Srila Prabhupada about the initiation arrangements for the time after he left us on May 28, 1977. Thus it appears that communiques about the new system were left deliberately vague for purposes unknown, although it would clearly have been relevant to explain what future was being described. Notably, in the letter to the GBC, the temple and temple presidents, there is no mention of, uh, this is incorrect, so I have to correct this. There is a mention of time in the letter that was sent out to the GBC and the temple presidents. It says, actually it says, henceforward. Oh, well, henceforward in the dictionary, both henceforward and henceforth both mean from this time on, indicating the in indefinite uh, future. So, <clears throat> the letter of July 10th, which describes a Ritvik system, the discontinuance of which is not even implied, stands as the last written document personally authorized by Srila Prabhupada regarding initiations. Had he wished the Ritvik system to be discontinued upon his physical demise, and knowing his disciples' tendency to misunderstand his instructions, why did he not state his wish in writing? He certainly had adequate time to do so. Srila Prabhupada had gone to the trouble over the years to set up this Ritvik system and had seen its effectiveness and uh, practicability. In the last year of his life, he discussed Ritviks on a number of occasions with his secretary, Tamal Krishna Goswami, though some of those discussions have never been made known to anyone except by a passing reference to them by Tamal Krishna Maharaj in the Pyramid House Talks of 1980. Srila Prabhupada did authorize and sign a letter sent out to all GBC men and temple presidents naming specific persons to carry out the Ritvik function. He removed himself as a participant in the initiation process for the last four months of his life, yet a firm disciple so made as his own. This was a successful trial run of his plan and, and it was proven to work successfully with no significant changes required. The following conversation is recorded in Hari Sari's diary for October 18, 1977. This is also in the, uh, is on tape. The tape record is al also exists of this conversation. I, I found it in the microfish uh, just before I came here. So it, it's not a, uh, an imaginary conversation if anyone wants to check it. Srila Prabhupada, Hare Krishna, one Bengali gentleman has come from New York. Tamal Krishna Goswami, yes, Srila Prabhupada, Mr. Sukhamoy Rai Chaudhary. Srila Prabhupada, so 
I have deputed some of you to initiate. Tamal Krishna Goswami, yes. Srila Prabhupada, so I think Jai Pataka can do that. If you like, I have already deputed. Tell him some deputies. Jai Pataka's name was there. So I depute him to do this at Mayapur, and he may go with him. I have stopped for the time being. Is that all right? Tamal Krishna Goswami, what Srila Prabhupada? Srila Prabhupada, this initiation, I have deputed my disciples. Is it clear or not? Tamal Krishna Goswami, it's clear. Srila Prabhupada, you have got list of names, and if by Krishna's grace I recover from this condition, then I shall begin, or I may not. But in this condition, to initiate is not good. Here, less than a month before Srila Prabhupada's departure, he has not ordered anyone to be an initiating guru. He continues to refer to his disciples as deputies, ritviks. Despite Srila Prabhupada saying, I have stopped for the time being, I have deputed my disciples, and this condition to initiate is not good. Still, all the disciples made at that time were considered his. What's more, he asked them all, Krishna Maharaj, this initiation, I have deputed my disciples. Is it clear or not? His Holiness's answer, it's clear. From this exchange, it appears that the concept of Ritvik was something that had been repeatedly discussed and Srila Prabhupada was asking Tamal Krishna Maharaj to question him further on it if there was any confusion in his mind. Apparently there was not. And yet, later in the Pyramid House talks, Goswami Maharaj claims to have been confused about Srila Prabhupada's intentions. Tamal Krishna Maharaj has nevertheless admitted in the Pyramid House talks that Srila Prabhupada only appointed Ritviks. Thus it appears that this system had been put in place indefinitely for would-be disciples until someone proved to be a qualified Acharya. There is no other natural or logical conclusion to be made. An example of a Ritvik system. There are a few interesting examples of Ritvik systems in Vaishnava history, one of which may be mentioned at this time. In an article called Declaration of the Spiritual Succession of Sri Chaitanya Saraswat Mat, one of the last lectures given by Srila B.R. Sridhar Maharaj, published in a book called Sermons of the Guardian of Devotion, he outlines a succession which involved appointing Ritviks for carrying on the process of initiation. He admits to having given Bhakti Sundar Govinda Maharaj the charge of the mat, meaning the managerial control. Then he states that he is giving him full responsibility of giving Harinam, Diksha, Sanyas, etc., as an acharya of this mat on behalf of myself. He goes on to say, with this I transfer these beads, and from now he will do so on my behalf as Ritvik. The Ritvik system is already involved both here and also in the foreign land. The Ritvik <coughs> is the representative. So if you want to take from me, and you take by his hands, then it will be as well and as good as taking from me. In the Mahamandal, the world, this Mahamandal in Sanskrit refers to the, the world, Sagar Maharaj, formerly Akshayananda Swami, and many others, they are also Ritvik of Swami Maharaj. As I mentioned here, this is how Srila Prabhupada is known in the Gaudiya Mat, and also myself. They may do so, but in this Mat, he, Govinda Maharaj, will be the representative. Henceforth, he will represent me in this affair beginning from today's function. Now I shall go from here, and he will do the necessary. On my behalf, he will give Harinam, Diksha, Sanyas, and everything. Although we have had our differences with Srila Sridhar Maharaj, this situation invites comparison with ours in 1977. Srila Prabhupada clearly gave the managerial authority of the society to the GBC in his will, and he appointed <laughs> Ritvix to initiate on his behalf due to being physically incapacitated. This was also the situation with Srila Sridhar Maharaj. According to the desire of my divine master, he says, I have been maintaining this disciplic succession, but it is no longer possible for me, as I am now too old and invalid. He even states that Akshayananda Swami and other Prabhupada disciples associated with him are Ritviks, even after the departure of Srila Prabhupada, of both Srila Prabhupada and Srila Sridhar Maharaj. They are also Ritvik of Swami Maharaj, and also myself. He then further amplifies, henceforth, he, Govinda Maharaj, will represent me in this affair. 
henceforth literally means from this time on. Thus, he has, in, he has indicated, as Srila Prabhupada did, that this arrangement would continue indefinitely. It is doubtful that Sridhar Maharaj would institute a Ritvik system or that he would speak of its continuing in the absence of an acharya unless it was a practice known and acceptable to the Gaudiya Sampradaya. He indicates that Srila Prabhupada's disciples could operate as Ritviks even after the departure of Srila Prabhupada. Anyone who knows something of the history of the Sri Chaitanya Saraswat Mat knows that many persons were voicing doubts about Govinda Maharaj's qualifications to be an acharya in the full sense of the word. Acknowledging such doubts, Srila Sridhar Maharaj grants Govinda Maharaj full managerial authority but makes an arrangement by which initiations would continue to connect aspirants with the founder in charge of that mat, Srila Sridhar Maharaj. A question which may arise is that these statements of Srila Sridhar Maharaj seem to contradict his former advice to the GBC. However, since Srila Sridhar Maharaj had twice seen the posting of unqualified persons as a charge result in disaster in the Gaudiya Mat and in ISKCON, it is probable that he took a page from Srila Prabhupada's book and instituted a Ritvik system to prevent a third misfortune. Srila Prabhupada's wisdom in setting up a Ritvik system is amplified by this example. In summary, the words and testimony of Srila Prabhupada, Tamal Krishna Maharaj, Jasoda Nandan Prabhu, Goridas Pandadas, as well as various documents and letters, and Srila Prabhupada's known process of initiating disciples while he was physically present, all prove that the Ritvik process was the system that Srila Prabhupada consistently maintained, expanded upon, and utilized up to the time of his departure, and wished to continue thereafter. Let the critics of this system produce one shred of evidence that the Ritvik system established by Srila Prabhupada is unauthorized and could not continue after his departure. We have presented many proofs that it should and was intended to continue. Where is indisputable evidence to the contrary? The onus is on the detractors. Srila Prabhupada never made any gurus nor did he ever state that anyone was immediately fit to be one. The indications of scripture are that one must be ordered to be guru by his spiritual master before he can become one. Everyone has a standing order to become guru. That order indicates a progression, however. When one is actually qualified, Krishna or his representative directly orders one to be guru so that one will, one will know it as his certain and unavoidable duty despite any personal reluctance or hesitation. Unless one has been so called and is so qualified, let him, if qualified enough to be appointed by the GBC, be a humble Ritvik on behalf of the greatest exponent of Krishna consciousness who ever lived. That is the greatest honor. That is the authorized system. Mm -hmm. <coughs> To move briskly. So um, I would le like to give a brief historical account of the Ritvik system in ISKCON as was established by Prabhupada and I shall also call on one or two witnesses who can give some personal testimony with respect to statements made by Srila Prabhupada and the Ritvik system. So this system was introduced in 1973. I'm going to read a small section from a letter to Rebati Nandan Swami, uh, which Prabhupada wrote on 4th of January, 1973. He says, So I think you now may be appointed by me to give first initiations to my new disciples by chanting on their beads on my behalf. In America, Kirtanananda Swami is doing that. So now, if there are two of you that will give me great relief. Kirtanananda will chant on the beads for new devotees in America, Canada, like that. You can chant on the beads for the European continent's new, di new disciples. They shall, of course, still be considered my disciples. Not that they shall become your disciples, but you will be empowered by me to chant their beads, and that is the same effect of binding master and disciple as if I were personally chanting. 
So that uh, empowerment, empowerment was given to a number of devotees during Prabhupada's physical presence, generally sannyasis, the first with Ketanananda, Rebati Nandan, then there are other letters to other persons who were similarly empowered. At any rate, we're more interested in what happened in 1977, but there's the established fact of the system being set up by Srila Prabhupada. Uh, in May of 1977, the final Leela of Prabhupada began. On the 17th of May, uh, Srila Prabhupada traveled from Rishikesh to Vrindavan, uh, where he announced that he was soon to leave his body. So, uh, in that month, some discussions began about setting up a Ritvikacharya. Sometime around the 23rd of May, uh, Srila Prabhupada mentioned to Tamal Krishna Goswami that he would appoint some Ritviks. And I'd like to call on Gauridas Pandit Das to uh, state his recollections of uh, the talks that occurred around that time. Uh, well, we were in Rishikesh in 1977, May uh, 16th. Speak louder. May 16th, Prabhupada. Uh, we were planning to go to Chandigarh in two weeks. Prabhupada was not at that time planning on leaving the planet. And then uh, there was a big storm that night. And the uh, power was going on and off. Lights were going on, on and off. And uh, me and Tamal Krishna Maharaj and Pradumna uh, were staying downstairs in the house. And uh, uh, Upindra Prabhu came downstairs and told us at 2.30 in the morning that Prabhupada said that uh, tomorrow we will go to Vrindavan, better to die in Vrindavan. And so we were all shocked at hearing this first information that Prabhupada <coughs> said he's going to leave the planet. So Pradumna and myself were sent to uh, Vrindavan to make arrangements for Prabhupada's arrival. And uh, we got there, we woke up Akshayananda Maharaj and before Mangalartika and we advised him of Prabhupada's statement. And so all the devotees started cleaning Prabhupada's room. And then Prabhupada, uh, I'll keep it short, but he called all the devotees into his room and he, uh, he gave a, a, a lecture saying that uh, I'm coming here to leave my body, but you should not lament. I've given you everything in my books. And if you simply read my books and cooperate with your God brothers, everything will go on nicely. And uh, he went on speaking, saying devotees were starting to cry and say, Prabhupada, no, you can't leave us. And uh, Prabhupada just said over and over, I am in my books. If you follow my books, read my books, cooperate with your God brothers, everything will go on nicely. And uh, then uh, a few days later, approximately on or around May 23rd, in Prabhupada's garden, Prabhupada, uh, Tamal kept reading Prabhupada letters that we, these devotees uh, want to get initiated. The temple presidents are writing so many letters. And uh, Prabhupada said, so, uh, I will announce Ritvikacharyas will initiate disciples on my behalf when I leave the planet. And uh, at the time I was a brahmachari from a very young age up till that time, uh, I had a very good memory, clear. I wrote this information to Satsuprup Maharaj in 1978, just a few months after, when I was surprised to see how actually ISKCON came. When I, we were under the impression that everything Prabhupada said would happen, so we, there was no controversy at the time. And it wasn't until 1978 that we saw all these changes that, that uh, I had to write these letters to Satsuprup Maharaj. Anyway, he said, uh, uh, questions were asked by Tamal, Prabhupada, should we put Vyasa sons in the temple room? Prabhupada immediately said, no, that would create enmity among my disciples. I think we'll come back to that, that point. That was in June. Okay, so. I just wanted to state that these tapes, I pushed the button on these tapes, and the tapes are not available at the archives. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the 25th of May. At that time, you showed the Nandana Das, then Swami, talked to Bhavananda Goswami <coughs> uh, with respect to this Ritvik system. Where are you? Let's have your testimony. Okay, on the 25th of May at 1 p.m., I'd like to point out that this is not, definitely not a recreation or a re-remembrance. These are factual notes that were taken while I was engaged in the Gurukul in Vrindavan. These notes were made in pencil, Indian style pencil, on Indian paper, it is not a re-remembrance. These were factual incidents to the best of my knowledge and belief. And these incidents were not written this year. They were written at that time. On the 25th of May, 1977, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, on or about 1 o'clock, Bhavananda Das, at that time Goswami, comes in the restaurant and greets all the devotees with a brief 
expose of the situation. Quote, Prabhupada said that now there is no more hope to live, I'm preparing to leave. So I have called all of you and have written a will. Actually, what was given is that the will was being discussed, which I've given to Tamal. I will choose a few of you to take care of the affairs of the society, keep the work going on. This movement has attained unprecedented glamour. Now keep up this reputation. Do not turn this institution like the Gaudiya Mat. After this conversation, I went and saw Bhavananda Maharaj and told him that I had heard from Smara Haridas at that time, who was my Brahmachari assistant, that, Brahma, that Smara Hari had heard from Goridas Pandit that Prabhupada was discussing the nomination of Ritvikacharyas and that these discussions took place in the garden. I asked Smara Hari, how did he know of it? He says, well, I've just spoken to Goridas Pandit, who was recording the conversation. I also approached Tamal Krishna Maharaj about this, and he told me, who told you this? Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me that if Goridas Pandit has said this, and Smar Harris said, who else knows about this? At that point, I indicated, well, there's only three people, and the conversation has been recorded, so what did Prabhupada say? And Tamal Krishna Maharaj says, we're just discussing at that time. Now, Bhavananda Das, I approached him and asked him about it. His understanding of the situation is that this was only a nomination of Rithvik Acharyas at the time. And this is also confirmed by another conversation that took place with the said Bhavananda Das on the 31st of May. Now these taped conversations, which will Prabhupada, there is one on the 28th of May, 1977, with the various GBCs. On the 31st of May, 1977, on or about 9.27 a.m., there was a fire sacrifice for Chaitya Guru Das, Prem Yogi Das, and Gopinath Das, who were taking sannyas. And also, numerous Gurukul children had been recommended to Srila Prabhupada to become his disciples because we felt that his departure was imminent and we had arranged to discuss with Tamal, to discuss with Tamal Krishna Maharaj to get these initiations done. At that time, I did the fire sacrifice. Prior to the fire sacrifice, the following conversation took place. YNS, I asked him, what's happening? He replied, this is with Bhavananda Das. Things are being discussed among the GBCs. Prabhupada said that there is a conspiracy among some of the Goswamis in Vrindavan to try to take over Mayapur in Vrindavan. I can't wait. This is exciting. I really like to get involved in this. I like power. YNS, I'll stick to the Gurukul. What is this I heard from Gauri Das about nomination of Ritvik Acharyas? Bhavananda Swami. At that time, he was referred as Bhav, as it was common amongst the sannyasis to refer amongst ourselves to a shortened form of our names. Bhav, it just means on behalf of Prabhupada. That's all. YNS, what did you say? There was another comment. He says, I can't wait till we start to do this. I took this as a reference that the movement was going to expand. We were going to preach. Whatever is the interpretation of that comment from Bhavananda Das, he may be free to explain. YNS, what did you say? I was a little shocked. Bob, oh, come on. Let's do the fire yagna. This is a factual account of his reconfirmation of his understanding of the actual meaning and intent of Srila Prabhupada's conversation, which did occur on the 28th of May. Perhaps so there were like two to discussions between Yashoda Nandana Prabhu and uh, Bhavan on the 25th of May, 31st of May. The first of the so-called appointment talks took place on the 28th of May. Um, the Satsurup Maharaj is one of the main protagonists in the conversation with Prabhupada. He asked the first question. However, it appears that after that discussion there was some confusion as to what Prabhupada's actual intention was. So perhaps Rupa Vlas, you could uh, fill us in on that. Well, according to Satsurup Maharaj's account, he's recently published an account, um, there was no confusion in his mind, but he had a conversation with Jai Dwaita Maharaj, and since he's here he can confirm that uh, that it was his understanding that the persons who were nominated as Ritviks would later become gurus after the departure of Srila Prabhupada. And Jai Dwayta Maharaj pointed out that it may seem perfectly clear to him but that others might not think it was so clear and they should get it in writing. Is that basically? Yeah. All right, so then uh, Satsuri Maharaj took his advice seriously so he approached tried to approach Tamal Krishna Maharaj to get this in writing. And this is in his own account. I'm just going to read very briefly what happened. He said, anyway, I asked Tamal Krishna Maharaj to please get this in writing. 
he asked why. I said, because people will not understand that Prophet picked the regular gurus when he named the persons who would initiate while he was still with us. Tamal Krishna Maharaj replied that he himself knew very well what Prophet intended and that was good enough for him. I tried again to ask him to, to ask him to ask Prabhupada to sign something, but Tamal Krishna Maharaj was not willing. So I could anyway then he goes through a he said, So Prabhupada never signed a paper. So things were left rather unclear, at least with respect to in uh, Sasarup Maharaj's mind. At any rate, I'll go on to July, we're running out of time. On the 8th of July, the second of the so-called appointment talks took place. Uh, on the 9th, um, a letter was drawn up by Tamal Krishna Goswami to be sent out to the society with respect to the appointment of Ritviks. That you will find uh, three or four pages from the back of uh, this booklet. July the 9th, 1977, signed by Srila Prabhupada. The 11 names are there. A brief description is given of the process, and uh, the second paragraph, I'll read, Now that Srila Prabhupada has named these representatives, temple presidents may henceforward send recommendation for first and second initiation to whichever of these 11 representatives are nearest their temple. After considering the recommendation, these representatives may accept the devotee uh, as an initiated disciple of Srila Prabhupada, by giving a spiritual name. So it's to be noted in this connection that even though this, this letter was extremely important, a very significant letter signed by Srila Prabhupada, there is no mention of this system being discontinued at any time. Uh, the word henceforward is used here. Henceforward, henceforward uh, indicates no cessation. Uh, had Srila Prabhupada intended this system to be stopped at any time in the near, near future, I think we can... Uh, uh, intelligently supp suppose that he would have had it mentioned in this letter that he would have said for the time being, for now, until further notice, or until such time as I depart this world. However, only the word henceforward is to be found. Um, on the 10th of July, as if to confirm the, an, our analysis of this letter, Tamar Krishna Goswami spoke to Yashoda Nandana Das, uh, showing him this letter. We have your testimony on that point, please. Okay, I'm reading from the original notes. This conversation took place on the 10th of July in the morning. Tamal Krishna Maharaj comes out of Prabhupada's room. I was at that time coming from the Gurukul, having come from the Gurukul building near Prabhupada's garden. I'm using the abbreviated format here. TKG, Haribo, Yashoda, did you see this? YNS, no, what is it? TKG, this is signed by Prabhupada, in parenthesis. He pointed out to Srila Prabhupada's signature in the left-hand bottom corner. I read the entire letter and then asked him, YNS, what does this all mean? TKG, devotees have been writing to Srila Prabhupada asking for initiations, and now Prabhupada has named 11 Ritviks who can initiate on his behalf. Prabhupada said that others can be added YNS. And when Prabhupada departs, TKG, there'll be Ritviks. That's what Prabhupada said. I would like to point out at this time that I did make a mistake in my original version in the Vedic Village Review. I forgot to mention the following statement by Tamal Krishna Maharaj. It's all on tape. Hari Bol, I had to return to the Gurukul, deeply thinking of the meaning of the conversation with Maharaj. So in addition to this official letter signed by Prabhupada and sent out to the society, there were one or two letters which we've reproduced here, sent out by Tamal Krishna Goswami, Rameshwar Swami also, particularly the letters, I think there were uh, at least three or four that Tamal Krishna Maharaj awesome. sent to various uh, prominent members of the society. Uh, one is reproduced here, third page from the back. This is uh, to Kirtananda Maharaj. If one studies these letters, one will find that similar wording is used from this time on, henceforward, etc., again indicating that there will be no cessation of the system. At any rate, these are the basic uh, historical facts that we have time to present now. There's no doubt that more facts will emerge as time goes on. Therefore, we uh, earnestly urge the GBC 
to take up this matter, investigate it fully, determine where missing recordings are, if there are such, and uh, thoroughly discuss the matter to the satisfaction of all the members of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I think so. We just said, can we confer for one minute here? Sure. What should I present more? Some questions? Yeah. No. Um, maybe I'll present some of the questions you want to ask. Mm. We uh, drew up, and uh, before we came here, we drew up a number of questions to various parties <coughs> in the society. Particularly, we have a list of questions here towards the back for Tamal Krishna Maharaj. Now, I don't know, should I try to read all of those or just some of them? Or? As much as you can. Well, I'll try, I'll read some of the questions we've composed. We feel these questions do need to be answered uh, in order for us to get a real clarification on this issue because it does appear that uh, there was some type of clouding of the issue. <clears throat> these are various questions towards the back, I think about uh, 10 pages from the back. Number one, according to your comment in, Pir in the Pyramid House talks, there were discussions with Srila Prabhupada about the Ritvik system before the May 28, 1977 meeting. What actually happened was that Prabhupada mentioned that he might be appointing some Ritviks, so the GBC then met for various reasons and they went to Prabhupada, five or six of us. This is further confirmed by the opening lines of the May 28th conversation in which you mentioned the previously unfamiliar term Ritvik. Prabhupada, I shall recommend some of you to act as officiating Acharya, Tamal Krishna Goswami. Is that called Ritvik Acharya? Srila Prabhupada, Ritvik, yes. A. Since it is clear that you had held previous discussions about the Ritvik system with Srila Prabhupada, where are the recordings of those conversations? B. Since such discussions were of crucial importance for the future of ISKCON, if there are no recordings thereof, why aren't there? Quote, this is a quote from an earlier conversation a few days before. Tamal Krishna Goswami, we tape everything Prabhupada says. Everything he says, we tape. Whether you're here or not here, guess. No, I don't want to talk on the machine. Tamal Krishna Goswami, we're not taping for any other purpose, but our Guru Maharaj's words are very sacred to us, so we tape all the time, whether you're here or not. So I just want to confirm that by going through the uh, microfish, I find that sometimes there were conversations that went on for eight pages about water connections in Vrindavan, for instance. So the fact that if there was discussion about the Ritvik system, it seems incredible uh, that these things would not have been taped. C. Why has nothing been reported by you about Srila Prabhupada's remarks during those Ritvik conversations? D. According to Goridas Pandit, there were a number of recorded discussions between you and Srila Prabhupada about the Ritvik system in which Srila Prabhupada made it clear that this system was also the arrangement for the time after he departed. Do you confirm or deny his statement? Two, why have you not made public denials of Goridas Pandit's assertions if in fact they are false? Considering the effects that the statements of Goridas Pandit would tend to have on the stability of our ISKCON movement, why have you not responded directly? Three, Jasodhan Anand Prabhu has also stated that you informed him that the Ritvik system would continue even after Srila Prabhupada's departure. Do you do confirm or deny his report? So I won't read that part again. We've heard it. Four, in light of the many conversations you had with Srila Prabhupada about mm -hmm. Sridhar Maharaj, why did you suggest to the GBC in 1978 that Sridhar Maharaj be consulted on the sensitive topic of the Guru knowing well that Srila Prabhupada credited him with the downfall of the Gaudiya Mat due to his insistence on creating an Acharya. Now, I have some confirmation. Do you want to speak briefly on this? That, that it was his idea that uh, someone be sent to Sridhar Maharaj? Yes, in, 19, in 1978, at the Mayapur festival, I was living with Tamal Krishna Goswami, Bhagavan Das, and Guru Kripa on top of the room that's on top of the building opposite the temple and at that time there were numerous discussions regarding how the system will be implemented in our movement and both Bhagavan Das and Guru Kripa asked them all Krishna Maharaj well if there are many questions which we do not seem to have satisfactory answers what should we do Tamal Krishna Maharaj then said we can, Prabhupada said that we can go to see Sridhar Maharaj regarding those type of questions 
Then, Tamal Krishna turned to me and says, Yeshoda Nandan Prabhu, you're all with Maharaj at that time. You're always interested in these kinds of philosophical issues. Why don't you go over to see Sridhar Maharaj and ask him those kinds of philosophical questions? And I said, are you sure that's what you want me to do? Prabhupada said that. And he confirmed to me in front of Guru Kripa and Bhagavan Das that this is what Prabhupada had said. Now, I'm sure there has been a, numerous versions of Prabhupada's statements regarding Sridhar Maharaj's permission that, that Prabhupada had said that we can go to see Sridhar Maharaj, but this is exactly what Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me in 1978 at the Mayapur festival. All right, there were many talks held in Mayapur and Bombay on this topic, a uh, topic of associating with Sridhar Maharaj, and you were present for them. More than any other disciple, you knew the expressed attitudes of Srila Prabhupada about Sridhar Maharaj's role in artificially creating acharyas, which led to the dissolution of the Gaudiya Mat. In the light of all of those discussions, as well as the many statements in Srila Prabhupada's books about the breakup of the Gaudiya Mat, with which you are also surely familiar, why did you suggest to the GBC that they should approach Sridhar Maharaj about the Guru issue, knowing so well his attitudes and likely suggestions? So I've just given a brief excerpt from a conversation which illustrates his knowledge of the history of the breakup of the Gaudiya Mat and Sridhar Maharaj's role in that here. So to save time, I'm going to skip over that. You can read that on your own. Number five, were you aware of the letter from Srila Prabhupada to Rupa Nuga Prabhu written in 1974 at the time you suggested consulting Sridhar Maharaj? Number six, Srila Prabhupada stated that Sridhar Maharaj was learned. Did he ever specifically state that he should be consulted about how to carry on the disciplic succession, that is, organize and institute a system for gurus and initiations in ISKCON? What is the evidence for this? Is there any specific recorded evidence that Srila Prabhupada wanted us to consult Sridhar Maharaj on philosophical and managerial issues. Number seven, who conveyed the idea to the GBC that Srila Prabhupada had exclusively appointed 11 successor gurus, since in fact, Srila Prabhupada had never appointed anything more than Ritviks and had not established in writing anything other than a Ritvik Acharya system? How did the GBC come to the conclusion of a successor Acharya system? Accepting your statement from the Pyramid House talks that there was never a guru appointment and that one is never guru by appointment but by qualification, then what authority had the GBC to appoint 11 acharyas, or for that matter to approve or appoint dozens? In Srila Prabhupada's presence, you said that we cannot become guru because we are all conditioned souls. This refers to a conversation in uh, April of 1977. Because we are all conditioned souls. And Srila Prabhupada agreed. Why is it then that in the physical absence of Srila Prabhupada, you say we need not be liberated to be guru? The final question. In May 24, 25, 1977, you helped to, to draft Srila Prabhupada's will. In that will, we find the following. Quote, the executive directors who have herein been designated are appointed for life. In, a, in the event of the death or failure to act for any reason of any of the said directors, a successor director or directors may be appointed by the remaining directors provided the new director is my initiated disciple, following strictly all the rules and regulations of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness as detailed in my books, and provided that there are never less than three or more than five executive directors acting at one time. End of the quote. The obvious question which, which arises even upon a superficial reading of this statement is what would happen when all of Srila Prabhupada's disciples were dead? There would, according to our current system of initiations, be no further possibility of appointing an initiated disciple of Srila Prabhupada. <clears throat> Why wasn't this statement amended or questioned? Unless it was understood that Srila Prabhupada would continue to have initiated disciples for a long time to come through the Ritvik system, the above would seem to put our society's future in a precarious position. I just made a note here, maybe this is obvious to everyone, but I'll present it anyway and then we'll bring it to a close. Note, there appears to be only four possible understandings, the first three of them improbable or preposterous. One, Srila Prabhupada was not concerned with the long-term future of his society. Two, Srila Prabhupada expected his society to expire with his disciples. Three, Srila Prabhupada was confused. Four, Srila Prabhupada expected to have disciples for generations to come. So that's five minutes. Five minutes. How many of them? Which one is that? Questions, not the. Uh... All right.
which one's the interest? Just, just, just the questions. Okay, I'll, I'll just, I have five more minutes, so I'll just raise a few other questions that we would like to see addressed at some point, either here in this proceeding or in the future. These are questions for Rabindra Saruprabhu. Because I understand he's going to be writing a paper to try to establish the proper Siddhanta about uh, Guru Tattva. So we've raised uh, in this booklet about <coughs> 20, well, about 19 questions, which would, we think would be very appropriate to be addressed on the issue of Guru. So first one, what is the evidence that the GBC is authorized to appoint or approve Diksha Gurus? Two, quote, specific, incontrovertible, and extensive evidence from Srila Prabhupada's books and the writings of the previous Acharyas that the Diksha Guru need not be self-realized. Three, what evidence do we have that the Ritvik Acharya system is unauthorized or inappropriate given the following statements made or authorized by Srila Prabhupada. So I won't read those at this time. We've already been through them. Four, in the light of Srila Prabhupada's comments on April 22nd, 1977, about his disciples' lack of qualification to be guru, at what point did they become qualified? So that's that famous April 22nd conversation. And uh, I'll just briefly, I'll read that quickly. You become, Srila Prabhupada, you become guru, but you must be qualified first of all. Then you become. What is the use of producing some rascal guru? Tamal Krishna Goswami. Well, I have studied myself and all of your disciples, and it's clear fact that we are all conditioned souls, so we cannot be guru. Maybe one day it may be possible. Srila Prabhupada, hmm. Tamal Krishna Goswami, but not now. Srila Prabhupada, yes, I shall produce some gurus. I shall say who is guru. Now you become a charger. You become authorized. I am waiting for that. You become all Acharya. I retire completely, but the training must be complete. Tamal Krishna Goswami, the process of purification must be there. Srila Prabhupada, oh yes, must be there. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wants that. Amara Agyai Guru Haya. You become Guru, but be qualified. Laughs. Little thing, strictly follower. Tamal Krishna Goswami, not rubber stamp. Srila Prabhupada, then you'll not be effective. You can cheat, but it will not be effective. Are we out of time? Thank you very much we'll for your uh, well-prepared and relevant presentation. First of all, what question is being raised? Uh, what evidence is being presented? What's the quality of the evidence? What counter-evidence is there? The topic, of course, is what system Srila Prabhupada instituted in regard to initiations after his departure. Toward the end of the presentation you just heard, a lot was said about uh, the qualification of a person who serves as guru, whether he has to be liberated or whether less than that is uh, adequate. This is a question I don't propose to deal with because it's not the question on the floor. The question on the floor is, what system did Srila Prabhupada institute? If he instituted a Ritvik guru system, then the question about the qualification of guru is not urgent. We can put it off. The main business is to get these Ritviks in place. On the other hand, uh, the question of uh, the qualification of guru, whether he has to be liberated and so on, that becomes urgent only if your other premise is wrong. Only if Prabhupada didn't institute a Ritvik guru system for initiation after his departure. If you're wrong, then it becomes an urgent question who's qualified to initiate after Prabhupada. If you're right, the Ritvik Guru system is the system, we can talk about those other things later. So the question I'm going to deal with is the question of the Ritvik Guru system. Is this what Srila Prabhupada wanted? Now what's the evidence that's been put forward to the effect that it was? We've had detailed evidence to the effect that Srila Prabhupada, during his presence, put in effect a Ritvik Guru system. Starting back from the days of Rebadi Nandan Maharaj and Prabhupada authorizing people to chant on beads, and continuing up through the time when he was saying, it doesn't matter, you don't have to consult me, whoever you think is all right, initiate him, give him a name, put the name in my book. The evidence is uncontrovertible, it's thorough, it's exhaustive, it's accepted by just about everyone. We don't intend to argue that. 
Srila Prabhupada didn't appoint anyone to become a guru for the future. He appointed Ritviks to initiate in his presence. That much is accepted by everyone. Now, the extension of that is that these Ritviks were supposed to initiate on pra Prabhupada's, uh, initiate Prabhupada's disciples in the future after Prabhupada's disappearance. That's what's at issue. And that's what Prabhupada is supposed to have firmly set in place before his departure. Now, let's see what the evidence is for that. We have, first of all, a memory from Goridas Pandit of one conversation that he overheard. We have a memory from Yashoda Nandan that Goridas Pandit told him that this is what he'd overheard. And we have a memory from Yashoda Nandan Prabhu that Tamal Krishna Maharaj had said that this would be the system in the future. Now, um, all right, these are memories. They go back far. Uh, I don't think I want to get into detailing the quality of that testimony. I'll simply point out something which has been amply pointed out by Rupa Vilas Prabhu, namely that even persons who are being put for, forward at gurus, as gurus at the moment uh, may have four defects. A tendency to make mistakes, tendency to fall into illusion, imperfect senses, and a cheating propensity. If you're prepared to argue that even the present leaders of the Krishna consciousness movement have these four propensities, I assume that you're unwilling to exempt Yashoda Nandan Prabhu and Gauri Das Pandit from those four same defects. Okay. So we have these brief memories, a couple of, one sentence from Tamal remembered and one sentence from Srila Prabhupada allegedly remembered. We then have two sentences severed from their context in the so-called appointment tapes. That is, I shall appoint some of you to be officiating Acharya. Is that called Ritvik? Yes. This is essentially the totality of Srila Prabhupada's statements on the matter that we have available to us in recorded form. I shall appoint some of you. Is that called Ritvik? Yes. Finished. Later in the same conversation, we find, well, I'll come back to that later. No, I won't come back to it. I'm going to deal with it right now. Later in, the, in this uh, same tape, we find Srila Prabhupada saying, they are his disciples who is initiating, his grand disciples. The comment from Rupa Vilas Prabhu is, this statement by itself is hard to follow. I submit that this statement by itself is easy to follow. Spiritual master, disciple, grand disciple. It's very clear what's being talked about. You can't have a grand disciple unless the spiritual master initiated a disciple and that disciple initiated his disciple. That's how you get disciples, grand disciples, great grand disciples, great 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 grand disciples, and so on. That comes up in the same conversation referred to. And Rupa Vilas's way with dealing with it is to say, gee, this is hard to follow, isn't it? I submit that it's not. What other evidence is there? There's a letter to Kirtananda Swami from Tamal Krishna Maharaj in which much has been made of the word henceforward, which means from now till some indeterminate time in the future. And it's alleged without much to go with it, that this meant, this was probably another definitive statement, another really impressive piece of evidence that this was supposed to go on till eternity. Finally, uh, we have the final, uh, we have some final dicta, some final words from Sripad B.R. Sridhar Maharaj. What impresses me about the evidence, about this piece of evidence, is uh, that it indicates how desperate you are for evidence. If I'm looking for evidence, the last evidence I'm going to use is evidence from a person I previously blasted all over my publication. After I've previously argued that we've made the greatest mistake in the world by going to this person, that he's unfit in so many ways, 
to then go back and say, and here's some really good evidence for you. My goodness, what does it mean about the evidence available? It means that it's scanty as anything, and you're reaching the bottom of the barrel. By that, I don't mean to discredit Sripad Sridhar Maharaj by saying he, but and that's the kind, when you go to evidence that you've rejected, or from a source you've rejected, and then come back and say, well, here's a good source of evidence. What does it mean? Either you accept a source of evidence as an authority, or you reject it. You don't pick and choose uh, at your whim. Now, counter evidence. The first question that might legitimately asked, be asked is put by Rupa Vilas Prabhu. It appears on page 10 of uh, Vedic Village Review. The first challenge to a Ritvik system may come. What is the precedent for such an arrangement in our Gaudiya Sampradai? You don't have to look at it. I'm just, that's about as much as I'm going to quote. I'm going to quote one more sentence. Uh, what's the precedent for such an arrangement in our Gaudiya Sampradai? And the answer given is, in reply, we must admit, we must all admit insufficient knowledge of our Sampradaya history to authoritatively and completely answer such a question. Now when you say that a little bit more uh, pointedly, what it is, is uh, there is none. What's the evidence for a precedent? There is none. We haven't come up with any, period. And it leaves room that perhaps in the future, at some other time, undesignated, there might be evidence forthcoming. Everyone knows what Srila Prabhupada's policy was on post-dated checks. We do not accept them. And we regard it as evidence of bluffing. There is no precedent. That's the, the straightforward answer. We have no precedent. Then the next argument made is, Srila Prabhupada did many unprecedented things. That's true. Srila Prabhupada can do many unprecedented things. That's also true. But to argue that Srila Prabhupada can do something unprecedented is not the same as arguing that he did something unprecedented. You have to prove it. Srila Prabhupada could have appointed zebras to initiate in the future. He can do anything. He could eat the whole world. But he didn't. So there is no precedent mentioned. And it's not enough just to say, well, Prabhupada could have done it if he'd wanted to. Now, next, what's the standard understanding? Okay, what's the standard understanding that existed in Srila Prabhupada's time about the cyclic succession? There might be some argument, argument made that in Prabhupada's time, we all understood there was going to be a Ritvik guru system dating back from the days of Yashoda, of, pardon me, of uh, Ray Barinandan Swami's appointment to Chan and Beads. Let's look at what the real system was. I propose that what was understood in Prabhupada's time, what was understood before Prabhupada's time, the standard understanding of disciplic succession implied in the very words is that after the departure of your spiritual master, you initiate. After one generation comes the next generation, then the next generation, then the next generation. That was my understanding from 1968 till 1977, and I consider myself fairly safe in saying that that was the general understanding. Why do I consider myself in saying that, safe in saying it? Where did we get that understanding? We didn't know anything when we came to ISKCON. Where did we get this understanding about disciplic succession? We got it from Prabhupada. Now, let's examine some misunderstanding from the past, which may illuminate things further. I'm going back to August 1968, where Chutananda Maharaj had apparently proposed to Srila Prabhupada that he himself could initiate disciples. The first thing I warn Chutananda, do not try to initiate. You are not in proper position now, 1968, to initiate anyone. Besides that, the etiquette is that so long the spiritual master is present, all prospective disciples should be brought to him. 
That's uh, August 21st, 68. Now, the next time this comes up is 1971. Here's a letter to John Milner. So far as you're taking initiation from Brahmananda Maharaj, I have no objection. Uh, you've got pretty punitive damages here. Just underneath this place. Yeah, we'll just put this piece up here. Thank you. So far as you're taking initiation from Brahman under Marsh, I have no objection. But it is the etiquette that in the presence of one spiritual master, one does not accept disciples. In this connection, Swami Brahmananda may write to me, and I will instruct him. <laughs> now we move on down the line to 1972. Apparently things have looked up a little bit for Chutananda Marsh. <laughs> Prabhupada says, Some time ago, you asked my permission for accepting some disciples. Now the time is approaching very soon when you will have many disciples by your strong preaching work. Stick to the line of our strong preaching method and many misguided persons will be blessed by your proper guiding. Then we come to 1974. In 1974, some interesting things started happening. Some of our god brothers began jumping the gun. We found pictures appearing on altars in New Vrindavan of Kirtananda Swami. We found uh, pictures of Hansadutta Swami in Germany. And this resulted in a conversation which I haven't found anywhere, but which I think some of you will remember, where Prabhupada begins, now there is some tendency in our society to become guru. Long silence. And what Srila Prabhupada goes on to say is essentially what's here uh, in this letter to Hansa Dutta, dated October 1st, 1974. I have heard that there is some worship of yourself by the other devotees. Of course, it is proper to offer obeisances to a Vaishnava, but not in the presence of the spiritual master. After the departure of the spiritual master, it will come to that stage, but now wait. Otherwise, it will create factions. Now. The final quotation is one that I'd like to give from 1975, which is pretty well along, considerably after uh, various people had been empowered to initiate on beads and perform fire sacrifices and so on. And that's the quotation that is here on the board. It's to one devotee, Tusta Krishna Maharaj. Prabhupada says, yeah, go ahead. There is a matter of etiquette, he says. You can bring it yeah. forward. There is a matter of etiquette. It is the custom that during the lifetime of your spiritual master, you bring the prospective disciples to him. And in his absence or disappearance, you can accept disciples without any limitation. This is the law of disciplic succession. That's clear. That's definite. That's in writing. That's the law. Now, the final thing, point I'd like to make, is I'd like to pick up a quotation that Rupa Vilas Prabhu apparently thought was very, makes a point that's very well taken. It's a quotation from Tamal Krishnamarj, which he repeats or paraphrases several times uh, in his argumentation. And here it is. Tamal Krishna is arguing that Srila Prabhupada did not, in fact, appoint people to become initiating spiritual masters after him, that he simply appointed Ritviks to initiate in his presence. And Tamal Krishnamarj says, and that's, all that, and that's all that it was, and it was never any more than that. If it had been more than that, you can bet your bottom dollar that Prabhupada would have spoken for days and hours and weeks on end 
about how to set up this thing with the gurus. But he didn't, because he'd already said it a million times. Now, that's my case. There's no precedent for doing what's talked about here, Ritvik guru system after the departure of the spiritual master. Srila Prabhupada never gave a clear instruction that we should do any such thing. Rather, he clearly repeated what had been the standard understanding all along, not only for 10 years in ISKCON, but for thousands of years in the uh, Vaishnav Sampradayas, that the disciple initiates his disciple, that disciple initiates his disciple, and on and on and on it goes. And if Prabhupada had wanted to change it, you can bet your bottom dollar he would have spoken about it for days and days and hours and hours. I'd like to, it's a hard act to follow, <laughs> but I'd like to, and that's the essence of the case that, that we have to put forward here. I would like to, uh, however, go back to the appointment tape because that's to me that's a recorded conversation with Srila Prabhupada beyond the vagaries of people's memories and a delegation was present so it wasn't uh, particularly relative to the persons he was talking to so on November 1st I sent out a uh, circular to the temples about this tape and pointed to this line, which to me I felt was decisive. Prabhupada discussing Ritvik, Satsrup Das Goswami, but he does it on your behalf. Yes, he says, that is formality. Because in my presence one should not become guru, so on my behalf. Uh, so that's just one line there about uh, Ritvik. Uh, that is formality, because in my presence one should not become guru, so on my behalf. So this is citing, again, this is a citation that we have here. It is the custom that during the lifetime of the spiritual master, you bring the prospective disciple to him. Formality means custom. Uh, and in his absence or disappearance, you can accept disciples without any limitation. This is the law of disciplic succession. So from here, we see when Prabhupada is asked about this Ritvik, he explicitly ties this Ritvik system to his presence. That's in this same tape. Now there's a response to this from Vedic Village Review. A long response, but I think the core of it's here. Uh, uh, it is said here, uh, I think Karnamritapuru uh, wrote this, he, that is myself, makes much of Srila Prabhupada's referring to his presence and concludes that there were Ritviks precisely because Srila Prabhupada was present physically and not otherwise. Well, that's true. That's what I say, and I do make much of it. But then Rabindra was assuming that these persons were actually fit to be gurus and that that would be their function when Srila Prabhupada was not present. This conclusion can only be arrived at if this section is considered out of context, however, to begin with, he has neglected the first exchange of the conversation. How will initiations go on in your absence? Uh, Prabhupada, I will appoint some officiating acharyas. So here the case, there's actually two points that are being made. One is that I ignore the beginning of the conversation. Well, this is because this argument is really based on taking the beginning of the conversation as the whole conversation, in effect. That when the question is asked, how will initiations go on after your departure? Prabhupada says, yes, I shall recommend some of you. After this is settled up, I shall recommend some of you to act as officiating acharyas. That's it, case closed, there it is. But the conversation goes on. The conversation goes on. And if you take this as Srila Prabhupada's answer, then you have to account for that immediately afterwards, yes, that is formality because in my presence, he contradicts himself. He contradicts himself. So you're foisting a contradiction on Srila Prabhupada by this reading. Uh, but 
Therefore, you cannot accept this first part of the exchange as the entire exchange. We know that when somebody asks a question, often in the give of take of conversation, it took some time for Prabhupada's complete answer to come out. That's what happened here. Uh, and uh, if you take the matter that way, the thrust of Prabhupada's answer is something like this. How shall initiations go on after your departure, Prabhupada? I shall begin by selecting some of you to act for now as Ritvikacharyas. I shall begin by selecting some of you uh, to initiate on my behalf while I am present. This is the etiquette. After my departure, however, you are permitted to become regular gurus, initiating your own disciples, but don't think that you become a qualified guru simply by appointment or automatic right of inheritance. You must be actually qualified by submission, surrender, and service to your own spiritual master. That's a purportful expansion, uh, putting everything together. And here it's clear, it's coherent, it's simple, there's no contradictions, it's in line with what Prabhupada has already told us, always told us, about the way disciplic successions go on. Uh, so there's no reason to excite this tape. Uh, it is not evidence that Prabhupada wanted a posthumous Ritvik system. And that's the crucial question, whether it's posthumous or not. Not that he already had a Ritvik system uh, in effect, that we know he was doing. The second uh, part of the argument is that I was assuming that these people were fit to become gurus. No. I'm just assuming Prabhupada said what he said, and we have to hear what he said. Uh, he says, I, my, in fact, the charge is not that, uh, the, the charge is simply that I make much of this sentence in this uh, conversation. Uh, act, I'm supposed to ignore it. I'm supposed to pretend it doesn't exist because it contradicts the thesis of Vedic Village Review. But it's there. And that's what Prabhupada says. Uh, whether or not they're fit people is another discussion because there is an alternative. And what the Vedic Village Review people have been doing is setting us up with a false dilemma. And they're saying, you have to choose either... Prabhupada instituted a posthumous Ritvik system or all these people were fit to become gurus. Choose. But that's not the dilemma at all. That's not the alternative. There are other alternatives. In fact, you may remember, if I may show you, those of you who are familiar with the history of this, uh, of this controversy, that in 1981, widely circulated around the movement was this uh, the bona fide spiritual master and the disciple. These are often referred to as the Jadarani papers. Uh, she was a main distributor, apparently not just a main author. Yashoda Nandana apparently was uh, participated in the authoring of some of these things. And here they consider a number of alternatives including the idea of posthumous Ritvik system. Uh, and it's rejected uh, for what seems to me fairly good arguments in here. In fact, that's what I thought that would be the last we saw of that. The, the uh, authors of this paper uh, advocate not taking diksha until there's a bona fide acharya. They were also of the opinion that the only one authorized to give diksha was a Maha Bhagavata, and that we should simply await for the appearance of such a Maha Bhagavata before Diksha goes on. That's another alternative. And that to me is much more in line with what I've learned from Srila Prabhupada, that there is no bona fide guru. Pray to Krishna to send you one. That's what you should do. Uh, but by setting up this false dilemma, this point isn't argued for, so now everybody's thinking they have to choose between these two points. Either all the people that, that were named as Ritfix, Prabhupada thought they were fit to give initiation, or he instituted a system of pos posthumous Ritfix. Uh, no, that doesn't follow at all. The question is simply, what did Srila Prabhupada say? What did he authorize? And I submit that the burden of proof is on our friends from New Jaipur. 
Because it is, a, it is another radical change. It, we have no evidence that it's there in tradition. It certainly goes against everything Srila Prabhupada ever told us about the Parampara system. And what he's saying with this posthumous Ritvik system is, look, I'm going to suspend the disciplic succession. After my departure, the, the, the disciplic succession will be put on hold. Maybe forever. If you take the reading of Srila Prabhupada's will, the way uh, Rupa Vilas would like us to, it means forever. Because obviously if you had to be Prabhupada's initiated disciple, no future Acharya's disciples can also be property trustees. So from that we can understand that maybe it'll go on forever. So Prabhupada is saying, at least indefinitely, until someone gets the call and uh, whatever is the Acharya, I'm suspending the disciplic succession. Now, I think we would have known about that. I don't think it would have been something that was so subtle that even one uh, person could have covered up. Because the effort here is to, is to, is to find a villain, uh, Tamal Krishna Goswami, and say that by his machinizations and uh, uh, artful and designing ways, he, one person, managed to cover up Srila Prabhupada's instructions. I think if Prabhupada wanted there to be this Ritvik Acharya system posthumously, we would have already known because he was changing everything he had taught us up until now about parampara and disciplic succession. And so I say the burden of proof has to be to show us where the order is clearly from Srila Prabhupada. The best that they can make out from the appointment tape is that it is contradictory and hence inconclusive. That's the best that could be done. Uh, otherwise, there's no uh, evidence to support such a monumental change in the way things have been done in the past. Uh, this is what uh, we, would, we would expect. I think that's all I want to say about here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to resume at exactly five minutes after 12. And I would request everybody to come and take your seats in 10 minutes so we'll be ready to start. During the break, if you've written out questions, give them to Naveen Krishna Prabhu so we can start sorting through them. Okay, thank you. We're only trying to open up the discussion and finally decide you know, how we can go about actually resolving it. Yeah, However, I do have this suggestion for you that I think if there are points that you want to comment on and so forth, yeah, you can give yourself the opportunity by writing astute questions, which you can even direct at yourselves, okay? Okay. <laughs> what was that? One thing I'd like to point out to you in the beginning, you mentioned that it would be inappropriate to mention like, the period between 77 and 1987. I'm not sure the mood of that. I'm not interested in the ones However, I think at certain points, we'll have to be raised, especially if we did have some points that we need to take one or two questions from the other early. I'm sure some people are raised with the ones that are the statements. We have to make certain statements about why they found it or not. There are very good reasons for that. And that's to be given importantly. Do you want to bring it up? It's out of my hands now. It's in the hands of the moderator. Yeah, okay. And you can, you know, you can request to make. Uh, make this. Well, the reason I, the reason I wanted to ask, uh, uh, I mean, when I write the question to your boss, why are you ignoring the uh, evidence that's brought forward in your boss's book? I'm going to ask them, why yeah, is it being that's ignored? A good that's a good why is it being totally ignored? You're on candid camera. <laughs> <laughs> I've also discussed with the parties here that I know we can't come to an entirely satisfactory conclusion here because points have been raised, they want to reply to points and like that, but we've uh, agreed to follow now this question and answer format and we hope that it will at least achieve our stated purpose today of giving the issues a decent airing so we can give some thought about uh, 
what should be done in the future on this. So the format, uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to read out the questions and uh, I'll address one of the parties to answer the question first and then the other party will have a chance to respond. We're going to give a five minute maximum time to answer the questions. Ma Shringa Prabhu, the sergeant in arms, will be over at that end there and he's going to time your responses and he will raise his hands at four and a half minutes. You get a four and a half minute warning. If you want more time, if you feel it's really important that that was such a complicated question that you couldn't possibly answer it in five minutes, request more time at the chairman's discretion. You may or may not get it. Also, if you have a que you're answering a question and I feel that you're repeating yourselves or you've already answered it sufficiently, I may ask you to stop at that point and we'll continue onwards. We're getting many, many questions here. I'm sure more than we can ever possibly handle in the next hour and a half or so. So the first question, uh, We'll begin with an answer from Rupa Vilas Prabhu. Why did Prabhupada put all the emphasis in his books on bona fide uh, guru if, it is, if uh, a bona fide guru is so impossible to find? Haven't you admitted yourself that Prabhupada didn't even hardly mention Ritvik in his books? You want me to answer that? Please. Certainly Prabhupada put his emphasis on bona fide guru in his books and we are meant to be connected to a bona fide guru however the the evidence that has come to our attention is that in the final years Srila Prabhupada didn't although he had great hopes for his disciples he didn't find that they were very qualified as uh, gurus and this was evidenced especially in this um, uh, a conversation that was made less than a month before the appointment tape uh, with Tamal Krishnamaraj, in which he, which Tamal Krishnamaraj gave his analysis that uh, all of us are conditioned souls, we're not qualified to be gurus, and Prabhupada agreed with him. Yes. That hopefully in the future they would become qualified. So the point is that uh, at Prabhupada's departure, we were not bereft of the association of a qualified, bona fide spiritual master, because the bona fide spiritual master was certainly Srila Prabhupada who lives forever in sound, as he also said many times, that he would live forever in his books, that he would live forever in his tapes and his instructions, and the follower would live with him. And this is also a very authorized system in our Sampradaya, that the predecessor, the words, the specific words and teachings of the predecessor Acharyas are our life and soul, uh, and that we may take shelter of those predecessor Acharyas. We may be instructed by them. We may be purified by them. We may be blessed by them. Obstacles may be removed by them. This is Srila Prabhupada's position, that he was Lord Chaitanya's chosen uh, uh, representative uh, to carry Lord Chaitanya's movement throughout the entire uh, world. And he left sufficient uh, shiksha instruction. As shiksha guru, he's existing eternally in his books. And no one is barred from that connection by, by the simple fact of time that he took birth later on, after Prabhupada's departure. No one is deprived of the association of a Mahabhagavat like Srila Prabhupada by, the, by his simply giving up his, his body. That association is eternal. In fact, there was a conversation in which we did print in Vedic's Village Review a little while back, that some of you may remember, where someone was raising to him this point about living guru. Prabhupada was talking about how someone could accept Lord Jesus Christ as their guru. In fact, in a number of occasions, as Paranj, uh, not Paranjan, Jagajivan, in Delhi, do you know that story? There was an incident where uh, one of Prabhupada's disciples was sitting with Prabhupada in Delhi and this question was raised about Jesus Christ. Uh, could people still accept him as a spiritual master? And Prabhupada said, yes, there's no harm in this. But, he said, the problem is they don't follow. The same thing in this conversation that we, that we re reprinted in this issue, the question was raised about Jesus Christ. He said, but I, the, the disciple is saying, but I was referring to a living guru. And Prabhupada practically began to sputter, Li living that it is not a question of, he said, spiritual master is eternal. Spiritual master is eternal. So the point is, we are not bereft of the association of a bona fide spiritual master at any time. And Prabhupada made this point, there is no question of being without a spiritual master. Spiritual master, you are never without a spiritual master. 
So this idea that we are somehow bereft of a bona fide spiritual master is one of the most nonsense ideas that has ever been propagated. We are never bereft without, uh, we are never without the association of a bona fide spiritual master. This idea is actually insidious. There's no question of being bereft of the association of a bona fide spiritual master at any time in history. It's never happened, and it never will happen. Anyway, that's my rather heated response. Okay, thank you. Your reply? Yeah, the topic is, um, did Srila Prabhupada Institute a Ritvik system? And the question that's been raised here is, if he instituted a Ritvik system, why didn't he put it in his books? Why did he just talk about bona fide guru and not say anything about Ritviks? And the answer is that we don't have an answer. That's the answer. The answer is that that question cannot be answered by the proponents of the Ritvik guru system. Why didn't Prabhupada put it in his books? Because Prabhupada didn't have any interest in instituting such a system, period. Question for uh, Rabindra Jayadwaita Swami. Uh, does your presentation given today represent the opinions of all the GBC members? And secondly, does your presentation represent the final conclusions of the GBC on this matter? Go ahead and speak first. There are two questions. Uh, does, do I represent the GBC? No. Do what, does what I say represent the final conclusions of the GBC? No. Okay. Now, a question for uh, Jayadwaita Swami, and there's also a uh, kind of a converse question for Rupa Vilas that you can think about. For Jayadwaita Maharaj, if uh, Rupa Vilas's evidence, the evidence they presented, could be proven true, uh, would you then concede their point of view? That they could actually be absolutely certain that Prabhupada actually said these things about Ritvik, would you concede their point or would you still think that another conclusion is the appropriate and correct one? And for Rupa Vilas, if some or all of your evidence could, was proven incorrect or couldn't be satisfactorily substantiated, would you still stick to your position? Or do you feel that there's so much logic and reason to it that you could uh, substantiate it even without your evidence. Marsh? If their position were proven true, would I concede to it? I'd not only concede to it, I'd endorse it, I'd offer my humble obeisances, and I'd send in for my subscription to Vedic Village Review. I'll send you one anyway. Wait, that's Well, you repeat the question again that I'm supposed to answer. If some or all of your evidence was uh, proven incorrect or couldn't be satisfactorily substantiated, would you still stick to your position just based on logic and reason? Okay, if some of the evidence was proven incorrect, uh, some if it means like one detail or one particular conversation or something like that, then I would probably be reluctant to completely give it up as a... Uh, as the actual position, but if all of it was disproven, obviously I would have to be a madman to continue to uh, profess it. Uh, Another question for you. Aren't we falling into the same trap as the Jews by, quote, waiting for the Messiah? Hasn't the Messiah, Srila Prabhupada, already uh, imparted a disciplic succession by saying, you become guru. This is a, question for me. This is a nice point uh, on the question of becoming. So our thesis is, is that we are not advocating the end of the disciplic succession. Now, what did Ravindra Prabhu call it? The uh, suspension, suspension of the disciplic succession. This is, uh, it's a kind of a straw man oh. argument because we are not advocating the suspension of it. What we are advocating is uh, the continuance of it, that Prabhupada appointed Ritvik Acharyas. Uh, Ritvik Acharya is also a kind of guru. It's not that uh, Ritvik Acharya is not an Acharya. He's also an Acharya who is specifically empowered for certain functions. And those functions have to do with the formalities of initiation. 
So we are, we are not in any way advocating the, the suspension of the disciplic succession. Could you just repeat the uh, question one more time? I don't want to leave any points out this time. You guys wait to nail me the last time. Aren't we falling into the same traps of the Jews uh, by waiting for the Messiah? Hasn't the Messiah, Srila Prabhupada, already imparted in, uh, disciplic succession by saying, you become guru? Yeah, so I would agree that we're, we're not waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah has come. Srila Prabhupada, and he has created a system by which uh, one can go on being connected to him very easily, the Ritvikacharya system. Now, in the, as far as becoming guru, we say that's a process. It may be that it's a formality that you don't accept disciples in the presence of your spiritual master, but it is not a formality to become guru. Becoming guru is a question of qualification. Becoming guru means qualified guru. It doesn't mean that automatically, due to some ecclesiastical convention, that at the time of the disappearance of the spiritual master, that one automatically becomes a guru. That's not an automatic process. It is a question of qualification. And those qualifications are described in Srila Prabhupada's books in great detail. And the fact of the matter is that the overwhelming preponderance of, of evidence and information is that guru means liberated, uh, Paramahamsa Uttama uh, Adhikari Maha Bhagavat. That is the definition of guru. And I'll, uh, let me ask this question, uh, perhaps it's rhetorical, but let's ask this question. Who had such an understanding while Srila Prabhupada was on this planet that guru was something other than a liberated person? No one had this understanding. In fact, we understood that guru meant liberated, self-realized soul. But rather, what, we see, what we've seen since the departure of Srila Prabhupada is that in the absence of uh, persons with sufficient qualification, we've, we've, we've evolved elaborate rationalizations of the philosophy to substantiate something which doesn't exist. And that is a spiritual master who is not a liberated person. A spiritual master, in fact, we, we find, for instance, in some of the GBC resolutions, that one may become a guru simply if he, uh, if he has the qualification of having not fallen down within the last five years. As if this was a, a scriptural uh, analysis of the bona fide spiritual master, another qualification of guru. For 10 years, you have to have been uh, chanting Holy uh, uh, Hare Krishna 16 rounds a day and following the regulative principles. These, I beg to submit, are the qualifications of disciples, not gurus. Guru's qualification is something much more. Now, there may be a few statements, and I would, I would submit in Prabhupada's books, if we want to limit the discussion to the law books for 10,000 years, in Prabhupada's books, there may be a handful of statements which say that, there, that which give some indication that there's something, some creature which is described that is something less than a self-realized soul who can be guru. But there are pages, there are hundreds of quotes which will assert that the guru must be a liberated self-realized personality. So when you go to interpret and or try to determine the qualifications of a spiritual master, you have to go to the preponderance of the evidence, and any exceptional statements have to be explained in, in terms of that preponderance of, 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 of evidence, and not that the particular statements which are in the minority are to be explained by the, by the, uh, the other way around. But to, to, make that, to make that a little clearer, what I'm saying is that you cannot take exceptional statements and make that the rule. You have to take the preponderance of evidence and explain those exceptional statements in the light of the preponderance of evidence. So, in that, that's the answer. You want to hear the question again? Um, I'm not sure that was entirely well, on the we point. Stick to the topic. I want to say the same thing that essentially, for the second time in a row, you've uh, gone to from the topic whether or not Srila Prabhupada wanted a Ritvik system to another topic whether or not the guru has to be a liberated soul, which is simply not the topic on the agenda. It appears that you're running for what you feel might be the high ground um, and abandoning what might seem to be the low ground. Defend the low ground. Well, Prove that Srila Prabhupada... Pa pardon me, pardon me. Prove that Srila Prabhupada instituted a Ritvik system, come up with substantial evidence, and that's the kind of thing that'll make me surrender and send in my subscription and so on. Otherwise, if you sw switch the topic to a different one time after time, you know, I lose interest. Yeah, I, I think I, I did answer the question. What I was trying to, to say is that 
Uh, if you could just again read the question. Aren't we falling to the same trap as the Jews by waiting for the Messiah? So the answer to that was no. That the Messiah has already come and the rest of it? Hasn't the Messiah, Srila Prabhupada, already uh, instituted a disciplic succession? And I, yes, the Ritvikacharya system is the interim system, and when one becomes a qualified spiritual master, that will be how the disciplic succession continues. Mm -hmm. That was my point, and I'm sorry it wasn't clear okay. to you. Next question. Uh, you can begin answering this. It has been suggested that the Ritvik system was established by Srila Prabhupada in 1973 with Revati Nandana Swami. However, it seems obvious that in 1977, Srila Prabhupada is making some adjustment of whatever system was operating up to that point. What do you feel were the fundamental adjustments being made in 1977, if any? Seems in 1977, uh, the change was they no longer had to write to him for confirmation with the names of the uh, uh, candidates for initiation. That was the change. Otherwise, people had for some time, other people had been chanting on the beads. And also, the other thing was somebody else was giving the name. Although when Prabhupada was, was uh, uh, doing it himself, uh, other people would pick the names. But uh, when in 77, I think the, uh, the, the Ritviks also picked the names. That's the best of my recollection, the two changes. Uh, maybe something to correct me. As far as I know, Pradyumni used to come up with most of the names. Um, I'm sorry, my memory is very bad. Could you read that question Essentially, again? Essentially, the question is, what kind of adjustments did Srila Prabhupada make in the initiating system in 1977, according to your view? Well, according to our view, of course, we presented it several times, but um, basically he took him, his physical um, uh, response to the request for initiation um, out of, he took himself out of the picture. In other words, basically the way he set it up was that um, people would simply become his disciples by, according to the discretion of the Ritviks. According to their discretion, they would be accepted as disciples and those names would be written into his book. So that means, effectively, for the last four months that he was on the planet, uh, people were being initiated without ha him having any physical knowledge of the matter. So they were, and so my, our point is that there was nothing to prevent this system from continuing because it was working perfectly well while he was on the planet with no problems. For you. Is there any evidence, as Rabindra pointed out, that the Ritvik system was only for while Srila Prabhupada was present? This has been our challenge to them from the beginning. What is their evidence? That the Ritvik, we've given, uh, although they've just they've uh, poo-pooed some of the evidence. Uh, <laughs> actually, we've given quite a bit of evidence that he uh, did mean for it to continue, and I really haven't heard them give a real uh, substantial scrap of evidence. Only indirect uh, evidence. Huh? Only indirect evidence. Some indirect evidence has been given, but no direct evidence that he didn't mean for it to continue. Mm. And we're still waiting for some real substantial <clears throat> direct evidence from their side. They say the onus is on them. I have to say that it seems to me we presented more evidence than they have. The onus is really on them. Let them come up with that evidence. They can't seem to do it. Just as in courts of law, lawyers will present tons of evidence, citations from all kinds of cases. But evidence is not the only criteria. Everybody is presenting evidence. All over the place, you go Monday morning in the San Diego courts, they'll be presenting tons of evidence. Some of it is inadmissible, some of it is irrelevant. Scriptural evidence has to go according to certain codes of interpretation. Now, there has been millions of interpretations of these conversations. One point I'd like to point out, that in courts of law, when you judge a person's last statements or his will, there is a legal term that is often used called a codicil. A codicil means an amending document that will reiterate or specifies certain unclear statements. Now, Srila Prabhupada made some statements in May. 
He made some statements on the 25th of May regarding Ritvikacharyas. He was discussing it. He made some statements on the 28th of May. He conf Bhavananda's understanding at the time on the 31st of May, his evidence to me was that this was on behalf of Prabhupada. The, the conversations in July, everybody talks May conversation, May conversation, but the evidence in the July conversation only mentions Ritvikacharya. The confirmation of that evidence the next day, the letter to all of the temple presidents of our movement, only confirms Ritvikacharya. The following letter the next day to Kirtananda Maharaj only confirms Ritvikacharya. The other letter on the 21st of July to, to the movement from Rameswar Swami also mentions Ritvikacharya. The conversations in October also mentions Ritvikacharya. And the last known statement of Srila Prabhupada when he was directly asked who will be the leader or the guru of the movement. If he already had put 11 successor acharyas, or 11 diksha gurus as it has been alleged, or 11 successor kum diksha acharyas, why wouldn't he say so on his last statement? It would have been very clear. But he did not say that. It was every evidence since July merely points out to Ritvikacharya on behalf, on behalf of Prabhupada. If you say that it is not, then you have to prove. I put you strictly to proof, as we say in courts of law. Come up with some factual evidence since that May statement till the 2nd of November statement where you can factually establish beyond a reasonable doubt according to Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru and proper rules of interpretation that is consistent, that is non-contradictory. Because let us not forget, although this conversation we have, this, we have agreed that we would not discuss the first 10 years, but when we start to look at many statements that have been cited, for example, in this report, as well as many other reports of our respectable GBCs, we're not talking just about initiations. We were talking about almost on the same level as Srila Prabhupada. We were talking about claims of successor acharyas to Srila Prabhupada. We were talking about an entirely different categories than initiating gurus. So I suggest that the burden of proof, gentlemen, and I respectfully submit this before you. You establish beyond a reasonable doubt from some statements in 77, because that statement by Tamal Krishna Maharaj, I personally heard it, I personally wrote down, and I will stand by it. And I'm prepared to make an affidavit in an appropriate court of law if required. People may believe it, people may not believe it. That's what I heard, and I respectfully submit it before you. You respond? Um, I agree with most, most of what you, uh, uh, what Yashonananda Prabhu has said. What he says about evidence is generally sound. What he says about the Ritvik Acharya system being established by Prabhupada during his presence is sound. What he says about the lack of any evidence for the appointment of 11 pure devotees is sound. Now, um, Rupa Vilas Prabhu asks, where is the evidence that Prabhupada didn't want a Ritvik Acharya system? You know, come up with it. So I submit that it's already come up with. It is the custom that during the lifetime of the spiritual master, you bring the prospective disciples to him, and in his absence or disappearance, you accept disciples without limitation. This is the law of disciplic succession. Now, Rupa Vilas Prabhu has made a great case for consistency, repeatedly calling for consistency in the pages of Vedic Village Review. I would argue that the, that the Ritvik system, the unprecedented posthumous Ritvik system is inconsistent with what Srila Prabhupada is talking about here. And therefore the onus, gentlemen, is on you. Suppose I say that in the future initiation should be carried out by a three-legged creature called a Xander. And a Xander is something which does factually exist and if you can't come up with evidence to the contrary, you have to accept it. Now that's just not the way burden of proof works. If I want to prove that there's something for which no evidence has been brought forward, I have to come up with the evidence. And it's not just enough to, to challenge your opponent and say, well, can you prove that a Xander doesn't exist? That's not legitimate in any court of law or in any rational discussion. So you've asked for evidence that Ritvik Acharya isn't the system. Here's a big piece of evidence right before you. And I accept everything else that you've said regarding the establishment during Srila Prabhupada's presence of a Ritvik Acharya system for his physically present time. Hare Krishna. Please go ahead. I mean, <laughs> if you're going to pin all your hopes on one letter, then and you say that's your, that's your evidence, uh, it's not a very strong case, frankly. Uh, 
I mean, we've just presented um, reams of, te of testimony, documents, and evidence to the contrary, and you've managed to come up with one letter. And, and if I can very briefly analyze your quote, your quote for you, it is the custom that during the lifetime of the spiritual master, you bring the, the prospective disciples to him. That's a custom. Becoming guru is not a custom. All right? Just let me finish, let me finish. Becoming guru is not a, is not a custom. And, and taking disciples unlimitedly is not a custom for someone who cannot deliver them from the cycle of birth and death. And in the fifth canto, this is condemned. This is specifically condemned. That if one is not able to free his dependent, if he is not himself freed from the cycle of birth and death beyond the four defects, that he should not... Uh, declare that he can liberate someone else from the cycle of birth and death because, he says, by such uh, unlawful activity one plunges himself into the ocean of reproachment Should for such unlawful activities. Or a father. Yeah, but at least he, the father can turn them over to a bona fide spiritual master. What's yeah. your position? Well, does, does, does the bona fide spiritual master become his father? That's what you say. Does the bona fide spiritual master become the husband? He does the no. That's the real no. father. Guru is the father. Right? I think really what you're making a mistake is that you can't read what Srila Prabhupada is saying here. He says this is the law of the cyclic succession. Now this is not just one quote, there's many other things. We have a whole ream of quotes nicely sent to us by Ajamil. But we didn't want to bother you with all of them, but you can read them. They're showing that this is, uh, there's a preponderance of the evidence if you want to go by counting. Uh, that the, what the disciplic succession is. So Prabhupada said this is the law of disciplic succession. And the point is, is that if he's going to change a law, you really have to show that he gave clear, consistent uh, instructions to do so. All the time the arguments get shifted back to the fact that they believe no one is a bona fide spiritual master. That is another case, which I'd be willing to talk about that case, who is a spiritual master, who is bona fide. If we don't have bona fide spiritual masters, what do we do? From now to the end of the kalpa, if we have to. But let's get this other thing out of the way, this entirely fallacious fabrication that Prabhupada made up some system of posthumous Ritvakacharyas. It's a concoction. It's not Srila Prabhupada's order. Let's get that out of the way, then we can go on to discuss this other issue. Okay, we'll move on to another question. Since uh, the idea of Ritvik isn't what we've customarily understood as the way that the disciplic succession goes on, and Srila Prabhupada didn't refer to it uh, very much, uh, it's a, certainly a very serious matter. Now, how do we know, what evidence is there that Srila Prabhupada would accept disciples via posthumous Ritvik? What guarantee is there that a person can feel confident that they have actually established a relationship with Srila Prabhupada, in fact, other than just in their mind? I'll let Karnamita Prabhu have a chance here. Thank you very much. Um, first, this question of uh, posthumous. Prabhupada has already declared quite emphatically that there's no such thing as a dead guru. So what seems to be a problem here to me largely in uh, <coughs> accepting the conception of Ritvik Guru is the idea that Prabhupada is now beyond our reach, that Prabhupada cannot be contacted. The Prabhupada is not available to us. This idea of dead guru is not saying there is nothing but a living guru. As Prabhupada stated, there is only eternal guru. Um, when he was questioned with respect to the living guru, as uh, Rupa Vilas Prabhu stated earlier, Prabhupada was aghast. He uh, actually wouldn't countenance the concept at all. Uh, he said, Guru is eternal. Guru is eternal. Therefore, the Guru is available. Now, under a circumstance which Prabhupada has clearly defined, where he did not see any of his disciples qualified to become Gurus at the time of his departure, it is not uh, uh, a ludicrous thing to propose that this system 
uh, would take the place of the normal procedure, the customary procedure. The customary procedure is outlined in this letter here. But unfortunately, Prabhupada didn't see anybody who was qualified to take up this customary business. What was he to do? Uh, it is very clear that he set up a Ritvik Acharya system which could function in his absence because he made this uh